Well, welcome to our breakout session where you have an opportunity to meet three faculty who are doing research projects in blockchain solutions. So this morning, I already we have already met Dr. Um, Dr. Zach Steelman, and so I mentioned he's an assistant professor here at the University of Arkansas, and he teaches our blockchain development classes to our graduate students. Now I'm going to share one fun fact about each one of these professors because professors can feel very intimidating. Zach, I don't know if you know I'm going to share this on you, but Zach's fun fact for me is that he owns a vintage car services company. So if you need parts with your vintage car or help getting it up and running, call Zach. I could have done worse, Zach. <laughs> there's, there's a lot crazier facts you probably could have told me. <laughs> okay. And we already were introduced to Dr. Remco Van Hook. And um, you've had a lot going on even today. I can see you doing a lot with the Center of Supply Chain um, going on today. But I'm going to call out one thing because Professor Van Hook is also co-author of this wonderful book, Integrating Blockchain into Supply Chain Management. Um, he co-authored that with our Dean who you met yesterday and with um, some other faculty members from Supply Chain. So that, that's an awesome resource. Okay, Remco's fun fact is in these COVID times, he decided to set up in his neighborhood a little mock Tour de France. And so he does this every night with his with his sons. And the last time I checked in with you, Remco, your nine year old took the yellow shirt. So shame on you. <laughs> what are you doing, old man? <laughs> oh. And it's a pleasure also to introduce you to Dr. Aaron Shu. Now, Aaron and I met when he was doing a postdoc here at the Dale Bumpers College of Agriculture food and life sciences at the University of Arkansas. He's now the Wilson Chair of Agricultural Economics at Arkansas State University. Um, um, Aaron is really interested in kind of the consumer economic side of this, like are customers gonna pay more for traceability on technologies like blockchain? I don't know if this is a fun fact or not, Aaron, but Aaron's gonna try to run a hundred miles in one go in about uh, two weeks here. So good luck, Aaron, uh, let us know how you do. Well, and I believe you're gonna, you're gonna share first, Aaron. So please take the right. stage. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks for having me, Mary. Let me get my uh, screen shared here so you can see what I see. I'll move you all off to the side here. And there we go. Hopefully you can all see that, huh? We can. Great. There we go. All right. Well, yeah, thanks again for the, the warm introduction and, and uh, thanks for allowing me to share some of our, our research here on blockchains and consumers. Um, yeah, it's been a very interesting process for me to learn about blockchain. I'm, I'm still new to this world and it seems like every time I get my, uh, my head around a piece of it, it changes. Uh, but yeah, so today I'll share a little bit about um, what we found in a study of consumers uh, with respect to blockchain traceability in the U.S. beef supply chain. I also want to acknowledge Heather Snell and, and Rudy Nyga over in Ag Economics Department for being part of this study. So, so there's a huge impetus, as many of you probably know, uh, for blockchains in food and agriculture. U.S. consumers directly purchase about $641 billion of food from retail stores annually highly competitive, highly fragmented, and everyone's uh, fighting for an edge, either in cost savings or increasing revenue, which is true for all businesses, but it's particularly cutthroat in the food industry. Um, so additionally, we've got regulatory issues. You know, we get about 48 million people uh, get sick, 128,000 are hospitalized and 3,000 die from foodborne illnesses uh, in the US each year. So, so that's a fairly substantial, substantial number. Um, We've also got trade issues. Uh, this, is, this is not new um, and it's growing, uh, growing concerns. So Thad Lively of uh, US Meat Export Federation has said that up till now, we, we really don't have a national animal ID or traceability system. Uh, it hasn't uh, stymied our export markets uh, tremendously yet, but it could create uh, unforeseen future vulnerabilities and put us at a disadvantage. So. This creates an impetus for us to find a way to trace our, our beef cattle from farm to fork. Um, our current beef traceability system uh, 
is, is primarily uh, consists of manual spot checking. Um, you know, it requires a lot of labor. You know, you've got farmers recording um, uh, their uh, every transaction through the supply chain, and then the USDA comes in and spot checks at each point, whether at the slaughterhouse or, or as it goes to retail. Um, so so it's, it lacks some transparency. Uh, the Beef Magazine recently surveyed producers about uh, implementing a whole supply chain uh, traceability system, and 62% favored this. Um, and of those, 82% supported this for disease containment and traceback. 76% supported it for opening more foreign markets. And the focus of our study today, uh, 71 supported it for consumer transparency. So producers see a potential to increase value. That's what we're all here for. How do we increase the value of what blockchain traceability offers? Uh, Frank Giannis, the FDA Deputy Commissioner of Food Policy, uh, made a statement earlier this year that um, they're ready to release a blueprint of FDA's new era of uh, smarter food safety so that while prevention uh, remains their priority, they're also planning to pursue ways to empower consumers with real-time information, uh, which would, would um, lead to direct to consumer outreach and notifications, likely coming from, from some type of blockchain platform. So these things are all in the works in the background. Um, so how might this work? How might a blockchain traceability system work? And I'm giving just the conceptual framework here. I'm not an, a blockchain architect, but from what I understand, we could connect all the various sensors that we have on farms now, uh, use the internet of things and digital record keeping to automate uh, this system. Rather than spot checking, we actually put every transaction into a blockchain uh, to keep that food identity preserved from the farm to the sale lot to packers and on through distribution to retail. So the potential exists to reduce transactional costs and create more efficiency. Um, maybe upgrade costs to the system, um, but overall we'll, we'll hopefully see some of those cost savings. So the technology would promise in the long run to improve traceability of food from farm to fork using this shared system viewable by the public. And there's the, the transparency that, can, that we're looking for. Um, so uh, there are a number of blockchain attributes though that might matter to consumers. So you know, we all hear the term blockchain initially, uh, many of you maybe like me heard it because of cryptocurrency, Bitcoin, Ethereum, and that was my only context for understanding what a blockchain was. And now I feel like I've gained a little more understanding. Um, but then you, you hear other terms, digital ledgers, which are effectively the same thing, but probably not as much in the public eye. Uh, so, so is there a blockchain branding? When you throw, slap that name blockchain on a product, does it mean anything to a consumer? Um, there's a governance piece. So do people value a permissionless, uh, publicly governed system, an anonymous system, or would they maybe uh, prefer a private permission system managed by the USDA or, or by a corporate or third party? Um, how might they value blockchain or USDA certification with respect to these different attributes that they're already paying for, grass-fed or low-carbon beef or QR codes with producer information? So all of these factors uh, influence consumer trust and ultimately their valuation of a product. And so our big question, much more complicated than uh, the way it shows up simply here, but would consumers pay more for some sort of blockchain certification branding uh, for the way their product is, is traced? Um, so to get at this idea, we, we designed a choice experiment, which is just a series of choice tasks. Uh, so we have product labels and attributes with different price combinations uh, that looks like a, a real, as close to a real world market uh, scenario as we get. Um, we got about 1,096 responses from across the U.S. Uh, representing uh, the U.S. consumer. So various demographics, education, and so forth. Uh, and we compare these labels and certifications to try to identify uh, consumer preferences and their comparative willingness to pay. So again, we're getting that willingness to pay is whether they would maybe give a premium for blockchain or maybe they require a discount. Um, in our case, we expect they might pay a premium. So beef is, is an ideal medium to test a blockchain traceability and branding because uh, governance right now is already pretty centralized under the USDA. So if we decentralize that a bit, 
um, and add layers of transparency, what might that do? It's already being piloted by a number of blockchains. Uh, one example would be Beef Chain. You can check them out. Um, you know, and there are a number of attribute issues that might help us um, uh, with the traceability piece. Can we preserve the identity, for example, of how much greenhouse gas emissions are, are associated with the production side? How much does a consumer care about that? How much would they pay more to know about that? The same with QR codes, where and how an animal is produced, the animal wel welfare piece, how much might they pay for that information? So here's an example of some of the labels that we use. Try to use common looking labels so as not to uh, create bias for one over the other. The digital ledger label would have, so about half of our respondents got digital ledger labels and the other got blockchain certified labels. So we can kind of see that blockchain effect. Um, there are QR codes and USDA certified grass fed and low carbon emissions or, or reducing uh, with the carbon trust labels there as well. So each of these is, is presented with some definitions at the beginning of the, the choice experiment. And, um, and then it's presented as just a binary choice with an alternate no buy option, right? We all choose not to buy things. So we have to have that as an option uh, to be realistic. Our prices for beef steak range from about $5 to $15 a pound. So, so here's what a typical choice task would look like. So the survey is not very long. You know, they, they would read a basic introduction and then go through about nine of these examples. And you'll see here at the bottom, these prices would change with every selection. Uh, and so if somebody didn't care about labels at all, they're gonna pick the lower price. And then from there, we start looking at the labels. Well. We also would expect on the left, three labels, we all like more information, right? Uh, but by alternating how many labels are on each uh, selection and providing a single label on the other side, we can isolate the value that those provide. And so what we're really interested in is when this USDA certified becomes blockchain certified or digital ledger certified. So our main findings from this, so one, uh, consumers were very unfamiliar with blockchain. Uh, and whether we asked digital ledger or blockchain, they actually both averaged about 1.5 out of five. So people really aren't familiar. More people were familiar with uh, Bitcoin or cryptocurrency, um, but that did not affect their, their results. So they still have a disconnect from what blockchain might be able to offer. Um, and so the branding piece did not actually turn out the way we might have expected. Now that said, whoops. Um, so that said, uh, the labels did drive differences in consumer value. And when those labels were certified, combined with a blockchain certified label, that did create a higher premium. So we saw that grass fed, for example, when with a blockchain certification label, that added a $2.56 premium. Not numbers approximate, of course, but it does show that there could be premiums or values added by blockchain. Um, still, they valued that USDA certification label more at 293. So, so we suspect that, that perhaps that governed blockchain, a USDA governed blockchain, the familiarity with USDA um, and the power of blockchain might, might actually elicit the most value. We further uh, segmented consumers into natural groups. So we found some people were more price and certification oriented, about 24% of consumers. They cared a lot about certification and a lot about price, not as much about the labels. And there are weak beef preferences. These are folks that just don't value beef that much. Um, then there are the labeling folks. They just want the, the grass-fed label or the QR code to know about their producer. Um, price wasn't as important for them. They were willing to pay a lot more just to have those labels on there. Uh, and they didn't really care where it was certified, oddly enough. And then this last category, which is where most people fall, it's where I would say I fall, right? I want more information, whatever it is, and I'll pay more for it. Um, so that's where about 38.6% of folks fell. Uh, so that's kind of a summary of what we found and how people might view blockchain. Um, we are gonna have a, a special issue uh, on blockchain and the ag and food uh, policy space coming out in applied economic perspectives and policy in, in coming months. So uh, keep an eye out for that. Uh, thanks again, Mary, for having me. I look forward to, to hearing what others have to say.
Thank you so much, Aaron. We're going to hold questions. Hopefully, we'll have time for the end, but I'm going to call up Zach now. I think Rimco was going to go next, but I can I can jump in either way. I'm I'm happy to go. So let me pull up my slides um, and get this going. Hold on, just need to get to there. We are and jump straight to the end. So here we go. All right, you see that okay? Super. All right, thank you for having me. Um, so I'm coming to you from the CECMP Supply Chain Hall of Fame, which will be hosted by the Sam M. Walton College of Business, officially as of next week when we'll virtually open um, on, our, on our website. And um, it houses um, uh, tributes to, uh, to Hall of Famers, including Henry Ford, Mr. Hunt, George Lauer, who invented the barcode. Um, and that's part of the reason why I bring it up. Um, when you look at the greatest that have been uh, and that are in supply chain, technology plays a key role um, in supply chain, um, going all the way back to, uh, to Henry Ford. Uh, and that's why it is, uh, it is relevant to, to make reference to, uh, to blockchain in the context of supply chain, because it is an exciting technology that has a lot to offer for the future of supply chain. Um, you probably are familiar with this um, study where they looked at, you know, hundreds of uh, blockchain projects and where they found out on the top right um, that supply chain is becoming and has become a core focus um, in use cases and blockchain projects underway, according to these industry experts. And to me, as a supply chain uh, person um, that found out about blockchain as opposed to the other way around, that makes a lot of sense because blockchain can resolve traditional problems that supply chain managers struggle with. Um, it can create um, opportunities to, per, to create oversight, to, to, to remove traditional barriers and give us kind of a seldom seen uh, view and an awesome perspective on what's happening in our supply chains around the world that will enable us to take supply chain capability uh, and contributions for, for business and society in which we, we operate to new levels um, of value and performance. And why am I saying that? Well, if you look at the nature of supply chains on the left and some of the widely shared challenges resulting from that nature of supply chain on the right, it makes sense that blockchain might be a very valuable technology to consider to dispose of some of those challenges. So starting on the left, if you look at the nature of supply chains, supply chains typically consist of multiple tiers of businesses um, that in a sequence of transactions that are independent buying and selling relationships um, function in, in the context of a chain. Um, we typically have distributed operations. Typically they are distributed around the world um, and we are ultimately focused on serving a highly unpredictable consumer demand, um, and as a result, facing lots of risks in the process of doing so. So the challenge of supply chain is, how do I share data across all of those tiers and around the world in an effort to try and meet highly unpredictable consumer demand as close as possible in near real time? And so traditionally, over on the right, data sharing in supply chain has been sequential. So, you know, I'm party one and I tell you what I'm shipping to you, party two. And when you ship party two to party three, you do the same. So it's sequential information sharing as opposed to more instant. It means that um, we, and traditionally we've governed relationships individually um, and um, we have traditionally you know, you know, not been close to real time because of that sequential nature. And so that's why I think blockchain can offer a tremendous step forward by creating an opportunity to more, you know, instant as opposed to sequential and across businesses as opposed to from one business to the next and from one business to the next, share information. And as a result, create more closer to real time visibility so we can be more proactive in managing the supply chain and less reactive. Question though is, 
well, what, what, how does that work? And what are some of the lessons learned from, uh, from pioneers? And that's where we've been focusing most of our research. We've done focus groups. We've done a little bit of data collection through surveys, but we've mostly focused on working with pioneering companies in the supply chain space and try to learn from the lessons learned from use case to pilot to scaling. Um, and I should note that obviously the pandemic has driven a much broader recognition of the importance of supply chain to uh, keeping business functioning, keeping the world going. Um, all of the nature and challenges that we've shared on this page you know, played out even more so in the pandemic than in a normal situation. And so it only makes the focus on blockchain more relevant from my point of view. So here's my incredibly complex page uh, that I can get away with because I'm back in academia. Um, and it makes a simple point. There are decision screens and considerations that we're learning about from the pioneers in this field that might inform decision-making of other companies in the supply chain and in the blockchain space that are interested in exploring uh, next project opportunities. It moves from the left where we focus on what is a good use case for blockchain in the supply chain to the center. How would you design a pilot to the far right? How would you move from pilot to an opportunity to scale that and implement that more broadly around the supply chain? So I'm not going to take you through all of the details here, um, but probably just a few call outs. When you look at use case, um, it is really important to avoid the risk of a solution looking for a problem. So it's really key to figure out which of the supply chain objectives, and we've gone through some of, over some of them on the prior page, could I meaningfully contribute to with blockchain? Uh, and if there's none, then maybe it's more of a solution looking for a problem. Um, secondly, when it comes to pilot design, um, what's exciting about blockchain is a technology, unlike some other technologies that are widely considered and used in supply chain, it doesn't have to come with a huge upfront investment in CapEx and a huge upfront commitment to changing our architecture because you can laser target a pilot on just a few tiers in the supply chain and with just a few interested parties, you can actually get going with the pilot pretty quickly and pretty inexpensively and learn an awful lot from that. And that makes blockchain a little bit different from other technologies. When it comes to scaling, however, um, we need to be realistic and, and realize that a supply chain is a very complex ecosystem. And so moving from two to four um, engaged stakeholders to hundreds um, is, is a bit of work. It requires shared governance and there's no excuse for um, fixing processes and cleaning up data. If blockchain is used to get better data about broken processes, then that's all we have, better data about broken processes. So I'll stop there. Um, 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 and um, I'll, I'll leave this with you as just a set of initial practical considerations that we found from the pioneers that we've had the privilege um, of working with. Um, as uh, Mary rightly said, um, we've written a book about it. So if you're interested in more, uh, that may be where you, where you can turn or reach out to me and I'll be happy to share more. But thanks for the opportunity. Um, and I think Zach, you're maybe next. Okay, let me share mine real quick here. Can everybody see that? Yes, okay. So I'm gonna kind of give a little bit of a different perspective on my kind of experience over the past three years of how do you educate and train students, corporate partners? How do you change their mind about blockchain? Uh, when I came back to the University of Arkansas in 2017, we were wanting to kind of start this blockchain project. Um, most of our partners at that time had very little knowledge about it. There was confusion in the market about it. And it was really during that peak 2017 crypto market. And so the vast majority of people that came to talk to me were wanting to talk about crypto, which is not really my specialty. I focus more on the development side of it, the actual underlying technology. And over the past three years of debugging uh, student projects, um, trying to find solutions for some of these student projects, Trying to find any kind of support whatsoever is difficult, not because things aren't happening, but because things are happening so fast. All of the software that I've used, all of the assignments I've developed, a lot of the training that I've gone through over the past three years, within three to four months, it's outdated. Um, I've bought a couple books here. Every book 
on Amazon about blockchain for the past three years. I've bought every one of them. I get them as soon as they come out. Every single one of them is outdated to some extent as soon as it comes out because it's moving so fast in the blockchain space, which is exciting for me, uh, but gave me a different way to kind of think about how do I teach this to students? I can't teach them a specific piece of software and expect them to go out and just use that in a company because by the time they started a company, it's going to be deprecated. So my ideas have shifted on kind of how to teach this. Uh, and it's really kind of helped my research as well. So I, I research in a variety of different areas, looking at the business value of blockchain investments. So I've, I've done some work with Mary and a couple other colleagues looking at patents uh, across the U.S. and China. Um, I've looked at a couple just organizational blockchain journeys. So some of the white papers that come out of Blockchain Center of Excellence uh, that I've written with Dr. Lasky and Dr. Cronin. Um, and we use those in our courses. And a lot of that is incorporated in Mary's book as well. Um, but we're also looking at, from a consumer standpoint, how do managers adopt blockchain technologies? Will they adopt blockchain technologies? And do they look at this in the same way that they look at a trusted third party? So some of my projects with people in supply chain, uh, Dr. John Elizas and, and Ellie Falcone, um, really focused on if we give people blockchain technologies, are they going to adopt them? Are they going to treat them as this third party? So we introduce a concept of um, automated software agents, which are really the blockchain that's playing that role. Can you trust that blockchain to do something that a third party would have typically done? Um, and I found some really interesting insights coming out of that. It's in late rounds of reviews, hopefully published soon, but I'm happy to share that with individuals if you're curious. Um, but I also have a variety of development projects that have spun up from other colleagues and from students that have kind of spurred out as we're trying to learn this technology as we go through. Um, but I really have focused most of my time on the coursework. Um, and I really have two classes that I teach, which is our, our Blockchain 2 and Blockchain 3, and, and those names evolve. Um, but these are development classes. We want our students coming out, building something, and having some experience by the time they graduate. Um, and it's been very interesting. Both of them are heavy development focused. We focus on permission blockchains for one semester so that they can think about from an organizational standpoint, how does a company think about a permission to blockchain? How do they think about the infrastructure and IT architecture needed for that? And then we pivot to the public blockchain sphere in the spring. And we kind of contrast those. What's the difference between those projects that are spinning up in the public space versus the private space? And it's really kind of two different mindsets. A lot of the stuff driven by uh, the permissioned blockchains are driven by big business, the IBMs, the Ernst & Youngs, the uh, Walmarts, the JB Hunt. And that's really because a lot of those technologies are incremental changes to what they're already doing in their system. These big companies aren't going to throw away their existing systems and put in a blockchain. They're going to integrate a blockchain into their existing system. So that's what a lot of those projects end up being. But there's a lot of innovation coming out of the public space, which is really disruptive technologies and trying to eliminate those big businesses that may have previously been there for some things. And so there's a lot of different mindset. It comes from like almost a startup mindset in the public space, which we really try to incorporate in our classes as well. Um, but what I found over the three years of changing my content every single semester um, is technology is the easy part. I've been able to put this in front of students for the past three years and every semester the students continue to build better and better projects. It's not the technology that is holding them up. It's a mind shift around the governance of why do I need it in blockchain? What would be the benefit of this blockchain? The technology part is the easy part. And if you've done any kind of proof of concepts inside of your company, you've probably noticed that you can hand this to the developers and they're not concerned. There's APIs, they know how to build it. It's a database. The concern is how do you get all of your partners to agree on what that programmer should actually put into that system? And getting two people to agree is complicated. Getting an entire group of people to agree on something that runs their business is an even bigger chore. Um, and so we've shifted to kind of helping students understand what are the governance decisions they need to make? What are the things that are kind of there that they're looking at? Um, and one way that we've been doing this is with hackathons. I find that a hackathon approach has been the most beneficial way for students to jump in and build something and build confidence inside of this. So the first year we did this was 2017 um, and we had about 60 so participants and, and seven or eight corporate partners that were there. Um, some of you were able to attend, very exciting. 
Um, I ended up deciding to use this as part of my class project. So every semester students go to different types of hackathons. They start their project there. And then I get to act as a guide and a coach for the rest of the semester to help them build those projects. And they're not just building a small proof of concept. They all have code behind them. They all have working blockchains. They all have integrated web front ends. Um, they all make commercial pitches. Um, they're really kind of building an entire perspective of understanding if I build this project, how do I pitch this project to a company? What is the core value of this that comes to the company? Um, and that's continued to grow. And in 2017, uh, our winner was for a, a JB Hunt project called Dispatch, which was working on the bill of lading. Um, and if you heard yesterday, um, when, when Craig was speaking, that was one of their biggest concerns is all the paperwork that's going along with all of this bill and lading. And they were able to build a project over a weekend that had an actual interface built around it. It had code around it and it had a small proof of concept within a weekend that they then continued to flesh out in that semester. And that's continued to grow. In 2018, we expanded considerably more. Um, and so I ended up having seven groups um, that all won in different rounds of the competition as we went through these. And luckily, uh, one of the things we got to do is invite all of those corporate sponsors back at the end of the semester so the students could present their full pitches to those companies. So the companies could really interact and see what are some ideas that we're gener generating out of this, but also who are some of the talent that's coming out of the program? Who are some people that may be already in our company in a different area um, that we maybe wanna recruit for some of these things? Um, we had a lot of luck of being able to present to the governor, which was a phenomenal experience of, of sharing a project that some of our groups had built on digital identity in Arkansas. And so they were very excited to work on those projects as well um, as it's kind of gone through. And this continues to evolve and be kind of a core part of the class. Um, I'd love to share more of these projects. The students have built lots of these and they all have commercial videos. Many of these are posted on YouTube. Um, but the students are building full interfaces and writing white papers for a lot of these projects. So some of them are very much uh, health related. So things like global vaccination um, that we did a version of a blockchain crowdfunding that was similar to Kickstarter, but on blockchain. Uh, we had a blockchain rental application where you could rent um, equipment like at the university. Um, we even had one that came out last year was looking at some of um, digital licensing for games. Um, and moving away from the core companies of, of Steam and Microsoft and Sony kind of owning the rights to all of these games, which if you read the terms of service, if you download a digital game, you don't actually own it. You're leasing it from them. Um, and so some of my students were working on how do we create this and eliminate this potential middleman and create a system that's a little more innovative. And so a lot of these projects were able to develop, but from an academic, what helped me is I get to see how these all these decisions are made. I get to see six to seven groups spin up every semester, come up from proof of idea to solution and see what their development process was so that when companies come to ask and say, you know, what are some of the issues we're going to run into? Most of my students have already seen those or I've kind of seen the issues they're kind of running into as well um, as we go forward. Now, kind of, you know, in the future, we continue to kind of spread out the hackathon. We're going to have one in the spring, hopefully, to incorporate those. Um, but I've actually started having my students participate in national hackathons and global hackathons. So this year, we've got a couple of students participating in the Wyoming hackathon since we weren't able to do it this semester. Um, I got a couple of students participating in the Ethereum hackathon in the spring. Um, but others that kind of pop up, depending on what the students are interested in, uh, I like to use that opportunity to give them a chance to get their name out there, but also guide them as they're building those projects. Um, what I ask is if there's any of you that are out there in a company um, and you are interested in working with some of these students or you have a potential use case that you maybe don't have a, a team that you can spin up, um, that bring that use case to us. Let the students work through it. Let the students churn through it and generate some ideas and then present that back to you to see if you can work collaboratively on some of those. Because what we found is many of the use cases that are brought to us at the University of Arkansas aren't blockchain use cases. Yeah, blockchain would work great in those environments, but they're not necessarily a blockchain use case. But the students are still willing to go down that path and figure out why aren't they a blockchain use case so that you can really dive into that effort a little bit further. OK, that's that's all that I had there. I'll leave it open for questions. You guys are awesome. I'm how honored am I to have you all call you all co-authors and two of you now colleagues. Yep. 
You, that was fantastic. You also have a lot of questions getting generated. So I'm going to just call on the person um, who I think will want to answer each one. And I'll try to get through three. So Zach, I'm going to ask you this one. How important is immutability from a blockchain ledger? How important is the concept of immutability? I think the concept gets confused around a lot of people of, you know, if I put something on this blockchain, I can never change. it, And that's not really what immutability is. All blockchains have two components. They have the blockchain, and then they typically have a state database. Or what are the values right now? And that's what most companies are running off of. All of your analytics are running off of what's going on right now. Now, if I make an error in my checkbook, for instance, I can always go back and make a transaction to fix that error. But that error would always be in the checkbook, right, in that running ledger. That's the same concept of immutability of we just want to keep track of everything that has ever changed. But it doesn't mean that we're going to have issues of, oh, I need to change something in the future. Even with smart contracts, there's ways now that they're developing and approaches of I can decommission this smart contract and roll it into this next one or I can point it to the next one. So that issue that used to confuse a lot of from the developer perspective of whatever we put on there has to be what it is. Whereas now people are starting to see it as this is just allowing us to track what happened as it went through this process. But a lot of the applications aren't necessarily built on, I need to know what this is forever, especially when you look at the public space that's gaming or tokens around that. They don't need to know backwards necessarily. They need to know right now. Um, so I don't see that as much of an issue or concern for at least people coming to me anymore in regards to immutability. Great, thank you. Okay, um, Professor Shu, if you had to redo your experiment, what would you change the second time you want to run it? I would have. Uh, that's a pretty easy one. These surveys are always uh, tricky. You hindsight's twenty twenty. You get your results, and you're like, "Well, I wish we could have tested this." And uh, on this particular one, I wish that we had spent more time uh, developing the gov different uh, strategies for a permissioned or governed blockchain. Um, so having a USDA governance, uh, USDA BC certification, for example. Uh, might have given us some insights, maybe even having a corporate uh, permission blockchain um, just for a branding strategy to see how those play out. That would be the, the probably the biggest change I would make to the survey. All right, great. Thank you. Remco, I don't understand this question, so I hope you do because I'm not a supply chain professional, <laughs> but we have somebody asking, can, can blockchains be used for internal operations and uh, be a solution for issues such as bull whip effects. I'm not familiar with the term bull whip effects. I would say that you are because you know what happened to toilet paper in the last couple of months. Oh, and that is a okay. perfect <laughs> illustration of the bull whip effect. And the answer is spot on. Absolutely it can because the bull whip effect is due to the uncertainty in demand. Um, the further you go upstream from the, from the consumer, you build in a little bit of a cushion, like to, to cope with fluctuations. And from one tier to the other, the cushion grows. And so we get further away from the true demand signal and we introduce an awful lot of waste uh, and ability to respond to the true demand signal. And that is why blockchain can absolutely help because you can accelerate dissemination of the true demand signal across multiple tiers simultaneously, as opposed to traditionally sequentially. Um, so yes, blockchain can be a very powerful um, use case in the context of can we share closer to real time, true demand information across multiple tiers? Absolutely so. Second part of that question, can you do that internally in the company? Absolutely you can. Even if we've looked mostly at multiple companies involved uh, because that's where the effect of near real-term information sharing can be can be larger, but most companies that operate around the globe have multiple en entities and multiple functions involved. So a smaller version of that benefit can be achieved within the walls of the organization, absolutely. Okay, great. Well, I wanna thank all three of you. Um, Remco, I hope you get the yellow shirt the next time you race your bike. Um, it's a Eric tough race today, but thank you. <laughs> Uh, Aaron, good luck on your 100-mile run. And Zach, um, good luck to you. Uh, I know I know that um, I can't wait to see you. I miss you. He's normally just down the hall, and I don't get to see him as much. So I want to thank you all so much for your contribution to the 2020 Blockchain for Business Conference. 
Thanks for having Thank us. You.